Communist forces surrounding the city of Hue in South Vietnam's northern sector appear to be regrouping for a major assault on the ancient imperial capital. With the situation tense but quiet there, the new government commander today was reported taking energetic steps to bolster the city's defenses. Most of the fighting centered in the central highlands around the Chupao mountain pass near Con Tum, as South Vietnamese airborne troops battled communist soldiers occupying Highway 14, the main link between Con Tum and Play Coo. The Saigon government claims at least 75 communists killed, with government losses so far placed at one dead, 17 wounded. With the signing of the Paris Peace Accords, peace in Vietnam seems imminent. As the war comes to a conclusion, veterans returning to America must contend with readjusting to life in a country also struggling to find its own place after the long war. We did abandon the South Vietnamese, and it's a real shame. President Nixon faces insurmountable political odds while facing charges from the Watergate break-in, and Congress does everything in their power to distance themselves from the war-torn country of Vietnam. This is the war's end and the painful repercussions of a peace lost. It took the population of the United States probably 15, maybe even 20 years after that to realize that it wasn't the warrior who lost the war, it was the politicians that were running the war. March 29th, 1973. For the first time in 12 years, no American military forces are in Vietnam. All of our American POWs are on their way home. The 17 million people of South Vietnam have the right to choose their own government without outside interference. And because of our program of Vietnamization, they have the strength to defend that right. We have prevented the imposition of a communist government by force on South Vietnam there are still some problem areas. The provisions of the agreement requiring an accounting for all missing in action in Indochina. The provisions with regard to Laos and Cambodia. The provisions prohibiting infiltration from North Vietnam into South Vietnam have not been complied with. We have and will continue to comply with the agreement. We shall insist that North Vietnam comply with the agreement. And the leaders of North Vietnam should have no doubt as to the consequences if they fail to comply with the agreement. But despite these difficulties, we can be proud tonight of the fact that we have achieved our goal of obtaining an agreement which provides peace with honor in Vietnam. President Richard Nixon gives his triumphant address to the nation as U.S. troops withdraw from South Vietnam remaining behind to ease in the transition and offer support are 159 U.S. Marines for embassies and offices in Da Nang, Bien Ho, Can Tho, and Na Trang. Fifty more officers also stay to establish the Defense Attaché's office. The war in Vietnam is the longest in American history at that point. The 15 years of conflict have claimed 47,244 lives on the battlefields and 10,446 non-combat deaths. 153,329 are seriously wounded, with 10,000 of them amputees. It has been a costly war. In April, President Nixon once more promises South Vietnamese President Thieu military support in the event that North Vietnam breaks the peace treaty. America will continue to provide financial support and military equipment to the South Vietnamese. 
In many ways, it is a concession for the treaty allowing North Vietnam to keep soldiers in the South. We got our lives together and, you know, we watched the news. We felt bad for the guys over there. And then when it ended in 1973, when the POWs came home, you know, it was, we watched it on TV. I watched it on TV. Uh, I wanted to see some of these guys. I didn't know anybody, but it felt good to see that happening. And there was a lot more that probably could have came home that never did. There were a total of 662 American POWs in Vietnam. About 602 came home with us, 601 or 602 um, came home with us in the big group. The rest were either released early or died in captivity. On April 1st, 1973, the last known prisoner of war, Captain Robert White, is released. The White House hosts a special dinner for prisoners of war on May 24th, 1973. Amongst the guests are Bob Hope, songwriter Irving Berlin, performer Sammy Davis Jr., and a certain Duke, also the star of 1968's patriotic Vietnam War movie, The Green Berets. I think this is a great country. It's a lot better off with you fellas back here. For the other veterans returning, it is not such a festive occasion. As part of what many see as a senseless war, they take the brunt of society's views of Vietnam. They really made a big deal about it. It was like a VIP coming home. It was a big day, they had a parade downtown, and, and we didn't realize at that time that the other guys who came back from Vietnam weren't treated like that. And it's, it's not, I guess it's as close to a survivor's guilt as you could get. Um, as we felt bad that we're getting all this, these accolades and stuff. And, uh, and basically, you know, um, all we were, were uh, we surrendered and, and got captured. And that's all we really did. We, we fought and we, were, we stayed together, uh, but we really didn't accomplish a lot for Uncle Sam. And then all of a sudden we're getting this big heroes thing. And these other guys, a lot of them, you know, had legs, well, we, several of our guys were in am amputations also. And most of us were pretty bang, probably banged up. But, you know, it's, it's no big deal. So uh, we got treated like VIPs. And, and I'm not saying it's to the detriment of the other guys. I don't think anybody could begrudge us the treatment, but I'm not sure it was fair compared to what they went through. To many veterans, being part of the United States military in the war is a mark of shame, not a badge of courage. Aside from dealing with social rejection, many come home suffering physical and emotional problems, including post-traumatic stress disorder, where one continues to feel fear long after the danger has passed. My back is still a major issue, uh, and uh, uh, there, there's been permanent damage to my body that will, will never be, you know, corrected. Uh, emotionally, you know, we've, we've uh, got P PTSD and, and, uh, uh, it, and with PTSD, it's, you know, a certain, you know, amount of paranoia and uh, who knows what else. When I came home, my mother and my father never even asked me what it was like. It was like, you, d you do not, the idea of being one day in green fatigues, changing dressings on somebody who might have lost a leg or an arm, and then 24 hours later being in the United States, and it's like it never happened, and it, it was a shock. It is not only some of the civilian population that disapprovingly looks at participation in Vietnam, but even some former servicemen from other wars, as Terry Steer learns upon his return home. One of the things that did is uh, one of the friends told me we got to go join the VFW. And here's my bad plug about the VFW. And uh, I went to a meeting and uh, they got a bar. They gave me a key that was my password to get in. And I went up to a meeting one night and I'm sitting there and somebody says to me, one of the older guys, the World War II guys says, what are you doing up here? And I says, well, I'm a member of VFW. I fought in Vietnam. 
And he says, that wasn't a declared war. So if you want to go down and drink beer with us, that's okay, but uh, we don't need you in at the meetings. And I am not the only one that said that. I've heard that from a lot of people. Uh, back then, because ours was not a declared war, it was a police action. They wondered how we got eligible for a VFW. Today, they want us because, you know, they're all dying off. We've got to keep that thing going. But it was just a, a shameful thing is, you know, I paid my dues for a lot of years, uh, but never went to meetings because they didn't like us. I, I think the biggest thing that bothered me, especially when I came back, um, I think my family was aware of it. I think my wife was aware of it, is that we didn't get the gratitude that we were expecting. Um, you know, we'd grown up seeing uh, pictures of the guys coming home from World War II in columns, you know, getting welcomed back. And uh, especially even like in the Korean War, a lot of the guys came home as a unit. The Vietnam War was, it was totally different. While the returning veterans deal with social and emotional fallout, many of them develop health issues stemming from Agent Orange. Sprayed until 1972, it was common for soldiers to get misted with Agent Orange in the Army's defoliation of Viet Cong cover and crops. If you know anything about Vietnam, it was divided up into four areas. And Saigon was known as Four Corps, where we were up in Da Nang, that was known as I Corps for the Roman numeral one. We had some spring towards the Ho Chi Minh Trail, but nothing like they did in the South. Um, but even so, the, the word was getting out that there could be something wrong with the water. Basically, they used Agent Orange to kill the foliage around the rivers so that the Viet Cong couldn't attack the Navy boats that went up the tributaries. But they also used it out in the field. And when the soldiers came in, you have to remember the nurses cut off their uniforms and their uniforms would be saturated with Agent Orange. So the nurses were exposed to it just like the men, maybe in a different manner, but we were exposed to it also. But at that time, nobody knew that Agent Orange was dangerous. And the men will tell you that they'd be out in the field and they, they would be sprayed, literally sprayed, and their uniforms would be saturated with it, but they were told there was no problem. So. Many, like Mary Walker, developed health issues ranging from various types of cancer, asthma, rashes, leukemia, to birth defects in children. These veterans will face a legal battle in coming years, with the first class action lawsuit beginning in 1979 on behalf of 2.4 million veterans. June 12th. 1973. With the servicemen and women back on America's shores, President Nixon is faced with keeping South Vietnam protected, but without a military presence. His intent is to watchdog North Vietnam, hoping they have learned from the costly and punitive Christmas bombing. Particularly in view of the fact that we've told them that I'll make a personal assurance and that by God, if they don't do it, uh, the Congress is going to cut off their water. That's right. That's right. That appeals to the more anything else, I think. Oh, I'm sure it does. And they're, they're just, they can't be under any illusions on, on either of those points. 1973 sees the apparent end of the war in Vietnam, but the start of one in Israel, which causes oil and gasoline prices to soar. The inflation will not only affect America, but the rest of the world, including struggling South Vietnam. Later that June, the passing of the Case Church Amendment by the U.S. Congress forbids the president from taking any military action in Laos, Cambodia, or Vietnam without prior congressional approval. This veto-proof legislation is approved two to one in both the House and the Senate. The ban includes bombing, which ceases on August 14th, 1973. On November 7th, 1973, Congress passes the War Powers Resolution, which requires the President to gain Congress's approval before sending troops abroad within a full 90 days. President Nixon's hands are tied. These new restrictions on his powers will give North Vietnam the opportunity to operate without fear of American reprisal. 
but Nixon now has a political war to fight on Capitol Hill, some of it of his own making. If the many allegations made to this day are true, then the burglars who broke into the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee at the Watergate were in effect breaking into the home of every citizen of the United States. And if these allegations proved to be true, what they were seeking to steal was not the jewels, money, or other property of American citizens, but something much more valuable, their most precious heritage, the right to vote in a free election. Watergate is coming back to haunt President Nixon. On February 7, 1973, the Senate establishes a committee to investigate the break-in and possible cover-up. The televised hearings begin on May 17th. When it comes out that the president's office features a new system to tape record everything, the tapes are subpoenaed. Nixon refuses, claiming his position as president gives him the authority of withholding them as evidence. That July, the U.S. Senate Armed Forces Committee begins hearings on the secret 1969 bombings of Cambodia, which testimony reveals totaled nearly 3,500 raids. Many congressmen are displeased with the president's apparent abuse of power. Vice President Spiro Agnew, known for being outspoken against anti-war protesters and other critics of the right, is himself under fire. Accused of accepting bribes and of tax evasion, starting from his days as a governor of Maryland, Agnew resigns in disgrace. He pleads no contest, but is still fined $10,000 and given three years probation. Who has been unwavering in his support of the policies that brought peace with honor for America in Vietnam and in support of a policy for the strong national defense for this country, which is so essential if we are to have peace in the world. Above all, he is a man with the responsibilities of the great office that I hold, should fall upon him, as has been the case with eight vice presidents in our history, we could all say the leadership of America is in good hands. House Minority Leader Gerald R. Ford is sworn in as vice president, replacing Agnew on December 6, 1973. I promise my fellow citizens only this, to uphold the Constitution, to do what is right as God gives me to see the right, and within the limited powers and duties of the Vice Presidency, to do the very best that I can for America. Ford is in for more than he bargained for. Meanwhile, Nixon still tries to impede the Watergate investigations, but eventually surrenders some, but not all, of the requested tapes. By July of 1974, Nixon is ordered to turn over the rest of the tapes as his continued refusal leads to talk of an impeachment. He has no choice but to turn in the remainder and is implicated beyond the shadow of a doubt. On August 9th, 1974, Richard Milhouse Nixon resigns as 37th President of the United States. To continue to fight through the months ahead for my personal vindication would almost totally absorb the time and attention of both the President and the Congress in a period when our entire focus should be on the great issues of peace abroad and prosperity without inflation at home. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. Vice President Ford, in his office for less than a year, is sworn in as the 38th president of the United States. He will be the sixth successive president to grapple and with the war in Vietnam. And I to be the first of many. I am acutely aware 
that you have not elected me as your president by your ballots. So I ask you to confirm me as your president with your prayers. And I hope that such prayers will also be the first of many. If you have not chosen me by secret ballot, neither have I gained office by any secret promises. I have not campaigned either for the presidency or the vice presidency. Watergate pulled the plug on the South Vietnamese, cut off all aid to them, so they couldn't get the bullets and the, uh, and the fuel for the airplanes and uh, you know, support, maintenance support, and that sort of thing. Meanwhile, the Russians and Chinese were just pouring stuff like crazy into the North Vietnamese. And uh, we saw the buildup and everything, and uh, we, couldn't, we had a prohibition against taking action thanks to uh, some of those stalwarts in Congress, and we just uh, watched it go down the tubes. The South Vietnamese were totally capable of handling that on their own if we, they'd had the support. With Nixon gone, and President Ford's hands more tied by Congress than ever, the North Vietnamese decide to try their luck. They do, after all, have the fifth largest army now at their disposal, thanks to Soviet support. Located just north of Saigon, the Phuoc Long District by the Cambodian border stands between North Vietnam and communist territories below South Vietnam. It is of vital importance to North Vietnamese trade routes. Taking it will be a test of America's position to aid South Vietnam. Starting their attacks on December 12th, North Vietnamese armies first take outposts on Route 14, which runs southwest to northeast and south of Phuoc Long. A deluge of rain saves the South Vietnamese from planned attacks the next day but it is a temporary respite. In two and a half weeks, the North Vietnamese take positions surrounding Phuoc Long. The South Vietnamese take a brave stand against enemy artillery and infantry, but are forced more and more inward of Phuoc Long. On January 6th, 1975, South Vietnamese forces take their final stand around the city's administrative center as the North Vietnamese cut off their escape routes and continue to apply pressure. The final outpost falls at 2,000 hours. The city of Phuoc Long has fallen into communist hands. Well, I, I felt that we wasted a lot of our time and a lot of personnel. Uh, people were sacrificed for nothing because there was no real game plan for the end result um, it just got to a point that the American people just got tired of hearing about it and they wanted it to end. So you sit back and say, well, did we really win the war or did we lose it? The American people, in my opinion, couldn't deal with having won two, World War I, World War II, tying the Korean War, then losing the Vietnam War. I understood politically why we did it, but in my heart it felt like a, be felt, felt like a betrayal. I mean, all the men that died, 58,000 names on the wall in Washington, D.C., what did they die for? You know, what was the whole thing about? And I'm afraid that when we pull out of Afghanistan, that the current crop of Vietnam, uh, current crop of veterans are going to feel the same way. Why did, what was the point? With defeat imminent in South Vietnam, President Ford his hands already tied by Congress, cannot justify sending troops back in, counter to Nixon's earlier promise to President Chu. We were betrayed by our own government and our government was being led by the nose, by our, 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 the people uh, back here who knew absolutely nothing. And uh, we, we could have gone and had a military and political victory in Vietnam if they had gone and allowed us to have that. The situation continues to decline in South Vietnam. At the same time, President Ford enjoys an Easter vacation golfing in California. The South Vietnamese are on their own, a fact now apparent to North Vietnam. 
I was disappointed that we didn't follow through with our support of the uh, South Vietnamese government. March 1975. North Vietnam continues their invasion of South Vietnam as the tired ARVN army retreats in the hopes of regrouping. Following them, to escape the juggernaut forces of the communists, are refugees from each city, 300,000 from Da Nang alone. Xuan Loc, a city already surrounded by the North Vietnamese, stands between the enemy and Saigon. The men leading the stand are ARVN's 18th Infantry Division of three regiments. If they fall, about 12,000 strong, Saigon will follow. General Li Min Dao of South Vietnam is determined to win. He will get his chance on April 9th. Americans remaining in Vietnam start making a retreat in early April. An evacuation control center at Tan Son Nut Airport begins operation 24 hours a day, hoping to lessen the amount of refugees for the country's inevitable fall. On April 3rd, President Ford announces Operation Baby Lift, a program to evacuate 2,000 orphans from South Vietnam, as well as Operation New Life, which saves over 110,000 refugees. The President urges Congress to approve $1 billion in aid, $722 million in emergency military assistance, and $250 million in economic help for the South Vietnamese. Half of Congress refuses to show up in protest. Ultimately, only humanitarian aid is approved for South Vietnam. April 9th, 1975. At 0540 hours, the North Vietnamese begin their attack on Chuan Loc. The South Vietnamese are not done they successfully counterattack, one unit moving in from the north. They inflict severe casualties on North Vietnamese 7th Infantry, and they move in without tank support, and then destroy three out of eight tanks sent in as reinforcements. By day's end, the North Vietnamese have successfully overtaken an infantry headquarters and the governor's residence and destroyed 18 South Vietnamese tanks. But it is not enough. The invasion continues. On April 19th, General Dao is ordered to evacuate from Xuan Loc. The next day, a convoy of 200 vehicles accompany an exodus of beaten soldiers and civilians. On April 21st, Xuan Loc falls under the control of the North Vietnamese. Two thirds of South Vietnam is now in their hands. President Chu is powerless. With no political support and his country lost, he resigns. With Xuan Loc taken, the North Vietnamese surround Saigon by April 27th. Their 100,000 troops far outnumber the exhausted 60,000 South Vietnamese defenders. Enemy troops start to push their way in at 0600 hours on April 29th. Air evacuations at Tan Son Nut Air Base are disrupted on April 28th at 1806 hours. As the refugees and Americans tensely await the next day's C-130 flights, the North Vietnamese periodically barrage the base. One enemy rocket hits a guard post at the DOA compound the next day at 0330 hours. It kills Marine Corporals Charles McMahon and Darwin Judge. They are the final American casualties of the war in Vietnam. The U.S. Embassy in Saigon is crowded by nearly 10,000 refugees hoping to escape the incoming carnage. As the crowds prevent bus travel to the embassy, evacuees are airlifted out from landing zones within the compound's walls. Sensitive documents and U.S. currency are burned within the embassy's incinerator. 
A group of 64 Marines are not there to defend against the North Vietnamese as much as the encroaching mob breaking through the gates. As they retreat up the stairs, they are forced to lock the rooftop doors behind them and use mace to deter the desperate crowd. At 0700, the song, I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas, plays on Armed Forces Radio. It is the signal to start Operation Frequent Wind, the helicopter evacuation of U.S. personnel. The last helicopter carrying the final Marines leaves at 0753 hours. On April 30th, Saigon falls, and with it, the end of South Vietnam. Newly installed President Duong Van Minh announces the surrender. More than 7,000 people are evacuated as South Vietnam falls. South Vietnamese aircraft are allowed to meet up with the evacuation fleet in the sea, but are forced to abandon their helicopters in the water. The aircraft carriers are at full capacity. South Vietnam is now lost to communism. Brought a lot of tears in my eyes because uh, everything that we did um, to try to help that country out, and uh, we just walked away. Just like in a lot of the battles that we had, where we lost a lot of lives and stuff, and um, we didn't retain anything, we walked away from them, and they were just taken over again. And then we fought again. You, you, you'll probably hear a bunch of stories, Hamburger Hill, Quezon, how we walked out of there and just left it. July 2nd, 1976. More than a year after Saigon is overtaken, South Vietnam's provisional revolutionary government of the Republic of South Vietnam unifies with North Vietnam. The resulting country is the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. Saigon is renamed Ho Chi Minh City in honor of their late leader. As for the formerly South Vietnamese, they are faced with further oppression by their new government. One million are sent to re-education camps, sometimes for several years. Others are forced to move to new economic zones where they must reclaim jungle land and live off it. And those are the lucky ones, not executed by the government. Many take to the water in their boats, fleeing the North Vietnamese takeover. These boat people will become a regular staple of Vietnam for years to come. Back in America, the soldiers and servicemen didn't get a ticker tape parade. Many of them put their uniforms away and tried their best to find jobs and readjust to life in the States. Congress passes the Vietnam-era Veterans Readjustment Assistance Act of 1974, designed to ensure equal opportunity for vets in the workplace. One of the worst problems in readjustment is through post-traumatic stress disorder, also known as shell shock, that has taken hold in many of the veterans. The first vet centers are established in 1979, and several organizations of vets spring up over time. Yet, to many in the outside world, Vietnam is looked upon as an embarrassment. That is about to change. Um, a lot of us coming home from Vietnam really didn't want to talk about the war. We felt that America had turned their backs on us. Um, it was your family support that probably kept you going. If uh, you were single, it's your mother and father or brother. It was encouragement to you know, keep going, don't worry about it. Um, I, I would say my wife was very understanding about it because she had lost her cousin who she was close with and she knew I, I had gone through it too. So it, it was a healing process. I, I think the wall is a great idea. I think when they put the uh, women's nursing memorial there, that was also a great idea for a lot of the things that the women had sacrificed during the Vietnam War too. A wounded Vietnam veteran, Jan Scruggs, founds the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund Incorporated 
on April 27, 1979, almost four years to the date of the fall of Saigon. They quickly raised $8.4 million in private donations for the building of a memorial. Well, Jan Scrubs was the founder of the wall in Washington, D.C., and I, I think a lot of us thought it was a great idea. I, I know I worked through the American Legion to get funds to help build it and things like that, soliciting money, going out and asking for donations. Congress soon offers three acres near the Lincoln Memorial for this new memorial on July 1st, 1980. A design competition is held and $50,000 is awarded at the end of the year to artist Maya Lin's design. It is both groundbreaking and controversial. Two walls, 246 feet long, join at an angle, starting at eight inches on the ends to an apex of 10.1 feet. Recessed in the ground, the memorial is not easily noticeable. As visitors come closer to the wall, the black sheen of the stone is in stark contrast to the white etched names of the fallen. Well, it's a little contrary in view. I, 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 I don't like names on things like that because it's starting to be seen. Down at, uh, in Virginia is one of the first that have a one where everybody's name on it. And because you leave people off and you make mistakes and you put people on there who weren't killed in action, whatever the criteria are, and then you end up spending all the time, they're, they're still putting names on the wall in Vietnam. Well, just like everything else, everything's got a memorial. Um, I thought it was one of the best things they ever did. I wasn't concerned about being a big black piece of granite. Um, the names on there, if you ever been there and touched that wall and you see some of your friends' names on it, it came to life. You saw your reflection in it. You've seen what happened, how you're still on the other side of that wall and all those guys that are not on the other side. Within the memorial is sculptor Frederick Hart's lifelike statue, the three soldiers of a trio of Vietnam soldiers. On November 13th, 1982, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial is formally dedicated. We're gathered today, just as we have gathered before, to remember those who served, those who fought, and those, who st those still missing, and those who gave their last full measure of devotion for our country. We're gathered at a monument on which the names of our fallen friends and loved ones are engraved, and with crosses instead of diamonds beside them, the names of those whose fate we do not yet know. One of those who fell wrote shortly before his death these words, take what they have left and what they have taught you with their dying and keep it with your own and take one moment to embrace those gentle heroes you left behind. I've, I've found all the names of the people I've, uh, that uh, were there and that I lost and uh, it's a long list. The memories of fallen women in the Vietnam War remain left behind until 1993 with the dedication of the Vietnam Woman's Memorial. I refused to go to the dedication. I went up there for the first anniversary and I was shocked and overpowered by it. And I was really impressed of what it was. And uh, uh, I love it now and she did, she did a very good job. Uh, and I, I really, uh, you know, I'm glad that she did it. I think it's a good idea. I, I mean, I, I've been to that, the memorial several times and uh, it makes me feel better, it makes me feel good. It's a healing process. I crossed a class and it's the beginning of the class and um, they have the Pledge of Allegiance and you'll see everybody stand up for maybe two guys that sit there and don't get up. And you would like to go over and shake the guy and say, do you know what I sacrificed for you to be here in this country? That you could stand up, but you can't. So you, you start to wonder, you know, what are our laws involving? Are we going one way and not the other way? And what I mean by that is, 
When I was growing up and being a kid, you know, you always stood up for the flag, you honored the flag, you honored your veterans and everything else. And today, a lot of these students figure they have rights that they don't have to do that. But the bottom line is that rights that you have, who gave you those rights? It's the veterans who made the sacrifices so you can have that right not to stand up. How is Vietnam remembered this 40 years later? Uh, first of all, in the history books, there's not much about it. Not many people teach it. There is uh, now in colleges and maybe high schools might have a little bit. Um, there's a little bit more of the legacy. It's just like Korea. Nobody really talked too much about that. It's part of our history. We need to learn by it. If you look at the history, book, high school history book is very, just skim through it once, and there's almost, there might be a half a page about Vietnam in it, uh, and that's assuming the kid can read it, can, you know, can read that far. The other half is the protesters. They talk about the protesters you know, demonstrating against this Ill illegal war using the same terminology that the communists used. And so I started just wondering, hey, maybe they did win after all. Most history books, Vietnam is only one paragraph, if that much. And, and our, our school children uh, don't know anything about it. And matter of fact, a lot of adults, their memory is very short. And, uh, uh, you know, the American history is important and it, it still affects us today. Everything, you know, the Revolutionary War, uh, the War of Northern Aggression, and Vietnam, you know, it's all important. It emerges in films such as 1978's The Deer Hunter, directed by Michael Cimino and starring Robert De Niro, and in Francis Ford Coppola's cerebral Apocalypse Now with Marlon Brando, Robert Duvall, and Martin Sheen. It deals with the war itself. While films like Martin Scorsese's 1976 film, Taxi Driver with De Niro, and the film First Blood, starring Sylvester Stallone, focuses on veterans trying their best to readjust to life back home. Bruce Springsteen's 1984 rock hit, Born in the USA, becomes the anthem of the veterans' experience back home. Oliver Stone's Platoon and Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket are amongst those movies that reinvigorate the war in Vietnam in film and television in the 1980s. Shows like China Beach and Tour of Duty show life on and behind the front lines. But it looks just like the Hanoi Hilton and the cells are shaped the same way and it looks like they're the same architect and I mean it's ext extremely realistic. And when they were filming the movie, uh, it's very, very accurate. And they had about 100 technical advisors, all of the POWs who lived in, in California. They did a parade in New York City. I sat and watched it on TV, and it was my welcome home parade, one that I never got. And uh, it was just something that made me feel so much better, and that's when I started getting involved with veterans again, and uh, I got myself involved with Vietnam Veterans of America because they were the ones that was doing things for us. May 7th, 1985. The Vietnam veterans finally get their ticker tape welcome home parade a decade later in New York City. Led by General Westmoreland himself with Mayor Ed Koch, the 25,000 veterans march across the Brooklyn Bridge and down Broadway. Um, they were going to have a ticker tape parade in New York and uh, this was probably about 15 years after the war had ended. And I really didn't want to go to it. Um, and one of the things my father said, being a World War II Navy veteran, he said, if nothing else, someday you can tell your grandchild that you were in a New York City ticker tape parade. And very few people can actually say that. And that's one of the reasons I went. Um, I didn't know anybody there from my unit because we were, had to all scattered and things like that. But as I said, I was going to college at night and I had a lot of Marines over there in Vietnam who were going to college at night and you can form a friendship with these guys because you're both veterans. And these fellows told me to go march with them so I marched with a Marine Division. Uh, at least you knew somebody in the group. But that was a rewarding experience, uh, marching in a ticker tape parade. And uh, Westmoreland led the parade off, off the George Washington, uh, off, sorry, off the Brooklyn Bridge. 
and uh, it, it went all day. I think he stepped off something like at eight o'clock in the morning. And the last soldier to come across the Brooklyn Bridge was something like 2.30 in the afternoon. And I've, I've been told, I don't know if this is true or not, but when they clean up after a ticker tape parade, they measure it in tonnage. And to this day, the Vietnam veterans have the largest amount of tonnage of the ticker tape parade. I think it was a reflection, a turning point at that point that the American people realized the sacrifices we had made for our country. For the first time, the war in Vietnam is accepted as part of America's heritage. Even today, um, you know, we wear our hats as Vietnam veterans. We have actually younger people come up to us and thank us for our service. And you know, it's been over 40 years, but it's something I think this country realizes now that you know, they, they made a mistake and it wasn't us, it was our government. February 3rd, 1994. President Bill Clinton, in an attempt to not only strengthen trade, but more importantly, encourage an accounting of American soldiers missing in action, lifts the 19-year-old trade embargo with Vietnam. He visits the country six years later. I still have some difficulty with that. Uh, if it means finding out more about our POWs and MIAs, uh, I guess it's one of those necessary evils. Uh, I have not been back to Vietnam. I will not go back to Vietnam. Well, one of the things I thought was kind of interesting, uh, President Clinton probably tried he, his best to stay out of going into the military and going to Vietnam, and then he becomes the first president to go to Vietnam, um, which kind of left a bad taste in my mouth because everything we sacrifice, and all of a sudden the U.S. government says, oh, everything's hunky-dory, you know, and uh, let's get together and help your economy and help our economy. and. You know, it, it leaves a bad feeling. It is a polarizing move. Clinton is known as a draft dodger in the 70s, and the move is viewed negatively by many veterans groups. Twelve years after the embargo lift, the fates of 325 servicemen is finally accounted for. The war in Vietnam holds a unique place in American history. It is a divisive war that consumed an entire generation and forever changed our role in warfare. But on the human level, it is a war that keeps demanding courage from its veterans, its pilots, its soldiers, artillerymen, prisoners of war, nurses, and more, decades after the last shot was fired. I think if we're going to go to war, I, number one, I, if we're going to go to war, then we should do it right, okay? Have a plan, follow through, and get out. Um, I understand that when the Viet Cong went to the peace talks, that they were willing to have a divided Vietnam. They were willing to have a North Vietnam and a South Vietnam. But I, I gather at that point, we were so tired of Vietnam that we just gave it to them. You know, and I wish we had done something like Korea, have a North and South Korea. On the other hand, that would have meant we probably would have had troops there up for 50 years, but we have troops in Korea. So, you know, it's mixed, mixed feelings. The only thing, I'm proud of what I did. I'm proud of those who I served with, and I'm proud of the United States Navy. Um, I, I think we did a fantastic job under difficult situations. Um, we, we did a lot of things um, in an environment that normally people don't see. I was very happy that I joined the Army, and I wouldn't have changed anything, except for maybe taking more pictures and taking down more names and addresses. Uh, so I could have gone and, and kept in, in contact after getting back. Uh, it was the greatest bunch of men that I've ever known in my whole life. We had a good time. It was a great life. It was one hell of a ride. The end. <laughs> Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe. 
to help keep history happening.